Greetings, everyone. Welcome to this Camera Meet the Author webinar. I'm Jonah Cohen, Camera's Communications Director. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's going to be a significant and I think uh, timely discussion uh, in the recent Hamas-Israel war last May, uh, when Hamas was launching thousands of rockets into Israeli civilian centers, uh, many of us were taken aback, I think, by the virulent denunciations of Israel uh, for defending itself. Uh, these denunciations could be heard in academia, in the media, of course, in the toxic world of social media. It wasn't uncommon to hear people accusing Israel of genocide, of apartheid, of ethnic cleansing, of colonialism, uh, name the crime. Uh, Israel was supposedly guilty of it. Even some members of Congress were tweeting venomous allegations against the Jewish state. Uh, at the same time, we saw uh, the footage of Jews being beaten and harassed on the streets of Europe and the United States for these alleged Israeli crimes. Uh, recently, of course, Ben & Jerry's ice cream made headlines for singling out Israel among the nations for a boycott, uh, supposedly on humanitarian grounds uh, as part of social justice. Uh, what are we to make of all of this? Is Israel guilty of these crimes against humanity? Or, or are these fabrications? And if they are fabrications, uh, how do we prove it? How do we reach those intellectually honest observers who just might not know much about or the conflict and who might be uh, swayed by these ubiquitous charges? Uh, what do we need to show them? To discuss such questions, it's a genuine pleasure to have Ben Dror Yamini with us, uh, the great Israeli author and journalist whose essays can be found at ynetnews.com and to be able to introduce you to him. I was introduced to him a few years ago following the English publication of his book, Industry of Lies. And that is a work to which I have uh, returned frequently for instruction and illumination. It is in my estimation, the single best volume on the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the current intellectual war uh, being waged against Israel in the media and in academia. Uh, what I found striking and, and persuasive about the book uh, was not only the depth of research, uh, but Yamini's use of anti-Israel uh, sources to bolster his arguments. Often he uses their own data as premises to draw his conclusions to show that their position can't be true, uh, that it's demonstrably false or inconsistent or, or dishonest. Uh, Mr. Yamini will speak now for about 30 or 40 minutes to discuss his book. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't give him the seven hours he requested, uh, jokingly, but truly his book is that rich with facts and logical arguments and could take seven hours or more to discuss. But you'll definitely uh, get some of his vital info today. After he speaks, uh, we'll go to Q&A with written questions. If you run your cursor at the bottom of your screen, you'll see an icon for Q&A. Uh, click there, type in your questions. We do want to hear from you. Uh, but now, let me pass this over to Ben Dror Yamini. Uh, thank you for joining camera. Thank you, uh, everyone who, uh, who joined us uh, in this meeting. Uh, yes, it, I, it was not a joke. I really need uh, at least seven hours in order to uh, uh, go on chapter by chapter in order to explain uh, what I want to explain. Now, I, I just want to say uh, whatever I'm going to say, uh, is not about politics, is not about opinion, is not about criticizing uh, this policy or another policy of Israel. That's fair enough. We do it in Israel endlessly. Uh, and we do it because, uh, you know, Israel is a democracy and, uh, and uh, I would say that most journalists are uh, criticizing the government and many times rightly so. It's not my story. It's not my issue. My issue is uh, uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, research uh, what I call now uh, industry of lies, because uh, I'm coming from what you might call peace camp. Uh, for many years, I was uh, um, a peace activist. Uh, I'm still uh, supporting peace, but I don't want to go uh, into politics. Um, and, and uh, the point is that I heard more and more uh, people speaking about the conflict, about the Israeli-Arab conflict, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And generally speaking, uh, 
I was I was uh, amazed. I was amazed because so many times I found uh, people, and I'm speaking about journalists, and I'm speaking about activists, and I'm, I'm speaking about scholars who had no idea uh, what they are talking about. Sometimes they lied. But because we do not have uh, seven hours, I guess I guess we will uh, immediately uh, begin because uh, because um, uh, uh, we have a lot uh, uh, to uh, do in this very limited time that I have. Okay, this is my book. It's not the most important right now. Uh, just uh, about my uh, background, as you, you can see, even before the Oslo agreement, I went all the way to Oslo in order to meet uh, the Palestinian leader, uh, Yasser Arafat. Uh, and I kept on meeting the leaders. I still uh, 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 meet them. This is uh, with the late uh, Saib Arakat, who uh, passed away uh, less than a year ago, unfortunately, because of the corona uh, virus. Now, I, I, I want to tell you about my first encounter with uh, what I call now industry of lies. I uh, read an article of an Israeli professor, Ilan Pape, and he wrote that the transfer is official moral option recommended by the IDC, which is an academic institution in Israel, a transfer proposed by senior Labour Party ministers to the government, Transfer is openly advocated by professors and media commentators, and very few dare to condemn it. I read the article, it was in English, and I uh, called him. Uh, in that time, he uh, uh, was a professor in Haifa University, and I told him, look, Mr. Uh, professor Pape, somebody used your name and published an article full of lies because nothing of what uh, you see on the, on the screen, nothing that was written in the article was correct. So I told him, uh, why don't you uh, tell them something because nothing of that uh, uh, ever happened. And uh, it was quite embarrassing because he told me, no, no, no. I wrote the article, I said, can you please validate something? And it was quite uh, embarrassing because uh, it took something like uh, 20 minutes and he could not validate uh, one uh, uh, thing from what you see on the screen. And uh, uh, then I told him, tomorrow I'm uh, planning to publish an article and I'm not going to call you a liar. It's not nice, but I'm going to call you a mega liar. And that's what uh, I wrote the day after about his article. By a coincidence, in that very week, it happened in two, 2002, we are speaking about 20 years uh, ago. Uh, I read another article, again in English, again by an Israeli scholar and a journalist from Haaretz uh, newspaper, uh, Yitzhak Laor. And uh, according to his article, uh, gas chambers are not the only way to destroy a nation. Gas chambers, it rings the bell. It's enough to develop high rates of infant mortality. If maybe somebody did not understand what he uh, actually argued is that Israel is committing a genocide against the Palestinians, but in a very sophisticated way by increasing uh, the rates of uh, uh, infant mortality. Wow. In that time, uh, uh, 20 years ago, we did not have the Google search as we have today, but I found the data. I found, uh, because I wanted to understand, is it what we Israelis are doing to the Palestinians? Uh, anyway, I found, and what I found was that actually infant mortality among Palestinians decreased dramatically. In this table, uh, you can see from January 80 to uh, uh, 2010, but it decreased dramatically, just the opposite, which means that what he published was a kind of a blood libel against Israel by a Jew, by an, a, an Israeli scholar that is publishing regular articles in Haaretz newspaper. And it went on. Uh, I'll give you an example of, uh, of uh, Professor Juan Kohl, uh, president of MESA. Some of you maybe know what is MESA. MESA is Middle East Studies Association in the United States, of course. 
And according to him, according to an article that he published in 2005, uh, what he wrote that is according to the 9-11 commission, the official uh, commission that was uh, appointed by the Congress, Al-Qaeda conceived the attack, the big attack, the 9-11 attack, as response to the Israeli attack on Jenin. Wow. Uh, I guess most of you cannot understand uh, the catch. Uh, when I'm uh, giving lectures to Israelis, uh, many of them understand immediately what's the catch. What's the catch here? The, first of all, I went myself to the report because it, it looked to me like, like something which never happened. And surprise, surprise, each one of you, by the way, can go to the official report. Uh, it's online. And uh, in the report, you will not find the word Janin. And why you will not find the word Janin? Because of one reason. The battle, it was not an Israeli attack, it was a battle. A lot of uh, uh, Israeli soldiers paid with their lives. Uh, in that, the battle was the year after the 9-11. Just to understand the depths of lies. He invented something. Now, when I published my book in English, uh, the uh, publisher asked me, uh, are you serious? That's what happened. I said, okay, uh, you can uh, check because otherwise uh, we might, uh, the two of us uh, be taken to court. And they checked, they checked every, every uh, claim that uh, uh, was in uh, my book. Let's go on. Sometimes the lies uh, are very simple, like uh, newspapers that publish that Gaza village uh, 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 was flooded because Israel opens dam gates. There is only one problem. Uh, there were floods in that uh, summer, uh, but there is not any dam in the south of Israel. Again, it was just something that, that never happened. But newspapers, it was not the only one newspaper that published it. Newspaper, when they hear it from uh, Palestinian activists, they immediately publish it without any fact check, something that we journalists, editors, uh, of course, must do before we publish uh, something uh, of that kind. And it's going on. A professor from Columbia, Ivy League University, as we all know, and according to his, uh, the title of uh, his article, he is going to give us only true facts and facts on the ground. How wonderful. Let's hear what uh, uh, the facts are. Tel Aviv, according to him, he wrote in the article, is the only Western city that does not have any Arab or Muslim inhabitants. Wow. I live in Tel Aviv, let me tell you. I love Tel Aviv. My doctor in Tel Aviv, uh, uh, is uh, uh, a Muslim Arab, and he lives in Tel Aviv, not even in Jaffa. Uh, my partner, in when I was uh, uh, in the days that I was, in the years that I was uh, in law firm, my uh, partner was uh, 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 an Arab living in Tel Aviv. But here is an Ivy League professor telling his students that no Arabs in Tel Aviv. He went on to uh, say that uh, Netanyahu called to expel the 1.6 million Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. Now, I know Netanyahu, um, and uh, I know a lot of things that he said, and I personally criticized in my articles, uh, but I know that uh, Netanyahu would never call to expel the Israeli Arabs, never. And uh, uh, I went to the uh, Netanyahu speech in the UN General Assembly, uh, which according to uh, Professor uh, Massad, uh, uh, that's where uh, Netanyahu said that he's going to expel the uh, Israeli Arabs. And the only one sentence that Netanyahu said in that time uh, was that the Jewish state of Israel will always protect the rights of all the Moors and one million Arab citizens of Israel. Just the opposite. Let me tell you something. Uh, some three years ago, I had a debate in Colombia, in the university. And of course, I had some uh, uh, anti-Israelis in the panel. And uh, I told them, uh, look, I have my own opinions about Netanyahu, but uh, 
I will never uh, forgive you that you forced me to defend Netanyahu. It's not my job. I did not come to do it. But you are lying endlessly about uh, Netanyahu. I don't like it. And yes, if I have to defend him, I will defend it. And um, it's going on. Just lately, just lately, it's, uh, uh, I guess you know him, Noam Chomsky. Uh, I hope you can also hear. I want, it, it just happened in uh, February, some months uh, ago. Uh, listen to what he said. Now, he wanted to prove that Israel is an apartheid state, white supremacy, Jewish supremacy, of course. And according to him, 90% uh, of the lands of Israel are not allowed to Arabs. Well, let me tell you, it's a lie. Never happened. There is something like between uh, 7 to 13% that were the uh, uh, lands of the JNF that were bought in the first place only for Jews. But even though those lands were allowed uh, to be bought by Arabs. Even Abdallah, the most uh, human rights uh, representative uh, NGO that is working for the Arabs in Israel, uh, admitted it in its own publication. It was never 90%, and it's a total lie. But here is a total lie by one of the prominent intellectuals. He was even chosen, I think, uh, some years ago to the uh, 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 most prominent intellectual uh, in the world. And he is lying, totally lying. And it's going on, and it's going on. Now, I, only to, to speak about uh, uh, lies, it will take me uh, uh, a, a lecture for itself. That is why I wanted uh, uh, seven hours, because each chapter is uh, a, a lecture for itself, a presentation for itself, but we don't have the time. So uh, something which next, we are in the second chapter. Um, one thing which, which again and again, people ask me mainly, may, not only, but mainly young students who do not understand the, the whole idea of a nation state. What is it a Jewish state? What is it? Why does anybody need a, a Jewish state? You can be a state and, and just like any other state, um, and not a Jewish state. And, uh, and they don't understand the idea. They don't understand, and unfortunately, I would say that many people do not understand what does it mean? Why do we need a, a, any nation state, a Jewish state? So let me tell you something. Just a, 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 a short, a short uh, uh, presentation of history. Um, a hundred years ago, both at the beginning of the previous century, uh, most of the world actually was ruled by empires. The Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire, uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire, the uh, French Empire, the British Empire, uh, even it was uh, USSR uh, before uh, Russia. It all collapsed. And it all collapsed, and Yugoslavia, of course, uh, in the 90s, it all collapsed because of one reason. Many, but many peoples were fighting for what? For liberation. They uh, were fighting for uh, uh, independence. Uh, and they fought actually against colonialism and imperialism. They did not want to be ruled by uh, superpowers by empires. They did not. And what they wanted is just one thing, uh, which is called now self-determination. That's why, actually, in the last hundred years, uh, a lot of nations, a lot of states were created based on the right, the very basic right of self-determination. Now, Jews, they were minority in the empires, and they were minority in the just burned nation states. So they were like 
where are we? And when Jews were persecuted, both by empires and by uh, national movements, they said, okay, we need our own self-determination. Yes, it was a dream of 2000 years and uh, uh, every Jew in that time uh, prayed three times a day to uh, uh, go back to Zion. So the whole idea of self-determination self of a nation state, and the same is with Zionism, the whole idea was anti-colonialist and anti-imperialist, just the opposite of what so many scholars are telling the, their students uh, today. Who Zionism is uh, uh, colonialism, just the opposite. Jews were uh, escaping from oppression. They were not the oppressors, just the opposite. And in order to understand it, we have to uh, see what actually was when Jews came to Palestine. First of all, Jews were in Palestine all the time. But of course, the, the emigration, uh, uh, the Zionist emigration began something like at the uh, end of the 19th century. In that time, there was not any Palestine. There was not any Palestine because, uh, because actually the name Palestine was used by Christians, by the Christians world, not by Jews and not by Muslims. And here you see the map of the area according to the Ottomans. You will not find the name uh, uh, Palestine. You will find uh, uh, Sanjak and uh, Waliat, which is uh, districts as part of the Ottoman Empire, but not any Palestinian identity. I don't want to say that, that there is not any uh, 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 Palestinian identity today. It's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is that, is that in that time, it was not that much populated district in the Ottoman empires and Jews began to emigrate. Now, what was in that time when Zionism began? We have a lot of sources. The most reliable source was the PEF, Palestine Exploration Fund that was established in London. And they sent a huge, delegation of uh, uh, geographs, of, uh, of uh, archaeologists and uh, demographs in order to see, and they measured every, but every meter in a square meter uh, in uh, what was in their name in that time, Palestine. For example, you can see here uh, Jerusalem. Uh, what you see in red, it's the only one populated area all around its, uh, its uh, all cuts. Now, it was a very small place. Right now, Jerusalem is bigger than the map uh, that you see. The same about Tel Aviv. There was not any Tel Aviv, there was only a small place which is called Jaffa. I don't know how many of you have been in Israel, but uh, what is uh, today uh, is the old Jaffa a very, very small place all surrounded with uh, uh, trees, the black points that you see uh, on the map, that's all. That was the population in that time. How many people were, we don't really know. Some people say that in all uh, the territory from the uh, river to the sea, from the Jordan River to the sea, there were something like between 200 and 400,000 people. We don't know the exact numbers. Let's go on. Uh, it was the background to the Balfour Declaration. It was not, as people say, a colonialist declaration. It was just the opposite. It was part of a big wave of, uh, uh, of, of uh, movements that asked for self-determination. So they received it. And at the end of the First World War, also the Jewish people and the Zionist movement received the same kind of uh, right. Even before the Balfour Declaration, it was the Foreign Ministry of France that had the same kind of declaration that yes, yes that yes, Jews, 
have the right for their own state, for uh, nationality, for uh, self-determination. And uh, two months after, it was the 14 points of uh, Woodrow Wilson at the end of the First World War. And actually, uh, the, main, uh, the main point was self-determination after the age of empires. So you cannot understand Zionism and the whole idea of the Jewish state without understanding the uh, uh, history of that time, the background, the historical background of uh, that time. And it's going on. In 19, the year after 1919, it was even accepted by the Arab leadership. Faisal, who was the Arab leader of that time, accepted this, uh, you see it in the red line, that this part will be for the uh, uh, Jewish homeland. It was accepted in the agreement between Chaim Weizmann, who was the head of uh, the Jewish movement, and the leader of the Arab movement. We Arabs look with uh, the deepest uh, sympathy to the Zionist movement, and so on and so on. It was in the Paris uh, summit. And it went on in 1922, when the uh, League of Nations decided upon to uh, give the Jews a homeland. It was decided upon. The mandatory of the uh, uh, British Empire uh, shall be responsible to secure the establishment of the Jewish homeland. And it's going on and on at the beginning. That's what, uh, uh, what you see on the map. It was allocated for Palestine, for the Jewish uh, homeland. Immediately after, it was uh, the first uh, partition and Transjordan received uh, uh, something like 80% uh, uh, of the territory. And, and there was not any state before uh, that was called Jordan or Transjordan, but here uh, it was established. And uh, uh, later on, I'm skipping in history just in order to, to uh, have the same background. The Peel Commission that was sent by Britain because of the conflict, and yes, there was a conflict between Jews and Arabs, uh, the Peel Commission, uh, uh, um, created uh, a new partition that gave the Jews actually only 4% from the original Palestine. Only 4%. It's only what you see now in yellow. That's all. That's what uh, the Jews uh, received. And uh, highly interesting, it was accepted by the Jewish leadership, Ben-Gurion and others. It was accepted, not because they wanted it, but because they understood in 37, we should take whatever uh, 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 Britain is giving us. We should take it because of uh, uh, people already knew about the persecutions of Jews in Europe, uh, uh, the Nazi uh, uh, party, the Nazi movement, uh, Germany, and so on. Later on, Ten years later, as I told you, it was accepted by uh, Jews. It was totally rejected by all the Arabs that were led by the Mufti Hajamin uh, al Husseini. Later on, uh, it was the partition resolution of 1947. Uh, and you can see it uh, uh, here uh, on, the pack, uh, on the map. Again, the whole Arab world said no we are not accepting any uh, Jewish uh, uh, entity uh, in the Middle East. Uh, they were all invaded. And fortunately, fortunately, uh, the Jews were not defeated. And uh, new borders were created. The borders that today are called 67 borders, just to understand. When we are talking about 30, uh, 67 borders, actually we are uh, speaking about the uh, ceasefire uh, lines of 49 after the independence uh, war. And uh, what was the background of that time? The background of, of that time was that uh, 
for example, just to understand the atmosphere. I was not born yet, but, but I could hear the stories of the other people, of my uh, father, of my uncles. They were afraid that a new extermination is going to be carried out. We are speaking about three years after the Holocaust. And people were afraid and people do not understand it many times. Oh, Israel uh, uh, was created, imperialist entity. What are you talking about? You have no idea what you are talking about. For example, Abdul Rahman Azam, Secretary General of the Arab League, declared this will be a war of extermination and momentous massacre. And it went on, a leader by leader, the leader of the Muslim Brothers. If the Jewish state uh, becomes a fact, the Arab peoples will drive the Jews who live in their midst into the sea. Here we have a new story, the Jews from the Arab uh, uh, countries. And yes, they invaded. And some people, from time to time, I hear scholars saying, whoa, uh, the Israeli uh, Palmach, which was the Israeli uh, army, the Jewish army in that time was much stronger. No, it was not much stronger. It was not at all. I mean, a, a lot of territories were occupied by the invasion of the Arab uh, armies. And it was almost, but almost a defeat. And it went on, it went on uh, and on uh, because in that time, I'm skipping it because in that time, uh, the big problem was created. And what was the big problem? Because of the war that the Jews were not defeated because of the war, the Nakba was created. When I'm saying Nakba, I guess uh, all of you already know the name, it's the Palestinian catastrophe. Because Israeli won, a lot of Arabs escaped, but not only escaped, also something like, I don't know exactly, there is a debate be uh, between scholars, uh, between uh, 25 to 30 to 35 percent were forced out during the battles, not as a, a pre-planned uh, 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 strategy, not at all, during the war. Now, now a lot of people, uh, for example, Professor John Mirsheimer, maybe uh, you know the name, some of you, uh, the Nakba is one of the great crimes of modern history. Wow. It's a lie. Why it's a lie? It's a lie and it, it's a propaganda because in that time, we have to understand that population exchange transfers were the norm. Not today, but in that time. Uh, between Turkey and uh, uh, Greece, we are speaking about almost 2 million people that were forced out from one side to another. Uh, in the Balkans, only the, in the Balkans, we are speaking about 7 million people. In uh, the ethnic uh, uh, Germans from all the surrounding countries uh, 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 near Germany, uh, between 12 to 16 million people were forced out. Between Poland and Ukraine, uh, 1.4 million people. And between India and Pakistan, 14 million people, population exchange. It, kept on to the second half of the previous century in 74, speaking about a quarter of million uh, of people. And it's, it went on and on and on. It was not only practically uh, carried out by states. It was only the norm. Fridge of Nansen, for example, received the Nobel Prize for conducting the population exchange between Greece and uh, Turkey. Uh, the permanent, the, the highest court, permanent court of international justice in the 30s decided upon that population exchange are the best way in order to achieve peace. And it went on, even Arab leaders uh, accepted it. Uh, and, uh, and the Peel Commission that I already mentioned uh, uh, declared in, in, in the conclusions that population exchange should take place. The Labour Party in Britain, in its platform in 1944, uh, 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 claimed that the only one solution to the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict in Palestine will be a transfer of populations. 
And it went on and on and on. We are not going to speak about all of them because we don't have Winston Churchill, the most important leader of the uh, of the free world in that time, declared in the British Parliament, expulsion is a method which will be the most sat satisfactory uh, and lasting, and so on and so on. Now, it is very interesting because now it is considered to be a crime against humanity. And when people blame Israel today, they do not mention only one fact, that in that time it was the norm. But they single out Israel and claiming, oh, Israel committed a crime. No, Israel did not. Uh, now, as part of the, uh, uh, of the historical background, we have to remember that this person, Mufti Haj Amin al Husseini, who was the leader of the Arabs of Palestine in that time, he declared publicly, kill the Jews, he, of course, that he uh, collaborated with Hitler and, and uh, declared that our aim is to kill all the Jews. And the Arab League decided upon that the Jews from Arab countries are going to pay the price. And a huge wave of pogroms were carried out against Jews in Arab countries. One by one, one by one, we, have, we cannot pass uh, 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 all of them because we don't have uh, the time. But the outcome was that yes, 711,000 uh, uh, Arabs from Palestine became refugees, but a bigger number of Jews became refugees because of the same conflict. A bigger number. The Jewish Nakba, which is totally forgotten, totally not mentioned about you have about uh, uh, one publication about the Jewish Nakba, you have something like 10,000 publications about the Palestinian Nakba. Let's go on. Jews, when they came to Israel uh, in the 50s, they lived in refugee camps. It was called Ma'abarot, refugee camps. But the problem was solved. Altogether, we are speaking about, from that time, about 60 million people who became refugees. Totally unmentioned. Why to mention them? Why to mention them? But you have to know it in order to understand the story of uh, the Nakba that was singled out as part of a propaganda against Israel. And it's go now, no one from that time is a refugee now, except one people, which is the Palestinian people. From 700,000, uh, uh, they are now according to UNRWA, more than 5 million people. It's the only one example, actually, of something of uh, that kind. Part of the problem is that the UN actually uh, uh, voted uh, in order to establish two agencies. Was, one is uh, the UNHCR, which is taking care for all the refugees in the world, and the other one, which is UNRWA, which is specified only for the Palestinians. And in all, in, in, instead of to solve the problem, all what they are doing is to perpetuate the problem. And it's going on and on. We don't have time to go uh, uh, for all of it. Sorry that I'm skipping because uh, uh, I guess I don't have uh, that much time. Now, I want to get uh, next to the next chapter, Six Day War. Occupation was created. Now, People do not understand, the, again, the background. Why did, why did we have this war? We had this war because the Arab League, for example, declared, declared publicly uh, that in 64, there was not any occupation. Collective Arab military preparation, when they are uh, uh, completed, will constitute the final liquidation of Israel. Every Arab leader in that time declared we are going to exterminate the Jewish state. It was, again, before uh, the occupation, before 67. And, and uh, uh, Ahmed Shukeri, uh, the leader of the uh, uh, Arabs from Palestine at that time, he said three days before the uh, war began, whoever survives 
among the Jews will stay in Palestine. But in my opinion, no one will remain alive. In that time I was a kid, I do remember myself digging uh, in order to find, we did not have any uh, basements or shelters. We just had to dig uh, in the ground in order to find a kind of shelter. Yes, we were afraid. People do not understand it. And uh, fortunately, we were not defeated. And we have to apologize about it. Ah, we were not defeated. And now we have Israeli control. It can be called uh, occupation, if you want. And now people describe the occupation. For example, Jose Saramago, the writer, a Nobel Prize uh, uh, winner. What is happening in Palestine is a crime, as what happened at Auschwitz. People like to uh, make this kind of comparison. Just let me tell you, for example, we spoke already about infant mortality, Palestinians in this kind of Auschwitz-like uh, 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 occupation are doing much better uh, than the global average. We can go on and on and on and on. Life expectancy is the same. Palestinians, because of the Israeli medical uh, 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 infrastructure, are doing right now much better than the average in the world and so on, we don't have time. And when people are uh, uh, promoting the BDS in uh, universities, they are saying, uh, like uh, uh, this professor, for example, that Israel uh, caused systematic destruction of Palestinian education. Very interesting, because why? Because in 67, it's only according to the Palestinian sources uh, uh, Gabi Barmaki, he was the president of Birzet University. And he said, before 67, we did not have one university, not in the West Bank, not in Gaza Strip. Right now, according to a publication of the Palestinian authorities, they have more than 40 high education uh, uh, institutions. And right now, Palestinians, according to their uh, research. Palestinians now have the highest per capita rate of university graduates in the Arab world. You can call it many things, but it's not the destruction of the Palestinian uh, education. Now, uh, many times people ask, uh, okay, but the people in Gaza are suffering. Yes, they are suffering. Nobody can deny it. That's a, uh, people in Gaza after Israel evacuated uh, uh, the Gaza Strip and to the last uh, centimeter. Uh, why? Why do we need this kind of uh, uh, siege, closure, blockade, call it as you want? Now, it's not because of Israel. It's because of the Hamas. Because the international community uh, put three demands to the Hamas in order to uh, 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 finish with the uh, uh, closure. Recognize the state of Israel, abide by previous uh, diplomatic agreements and renounce violence. The Hamas, again and again, again and again, we don't, I cannot go to all the history of the last uh, 15 years, but again and again, rejected the preconditions of the international community. The moment that they will accept the preconditions, there will not be uh, any closure. We don't need it. Me, as an Israeli, I don't want uh, anybody, uh, uh, I don't want anybody to suffer. I speak with uh, uh, people from uh, Gaza. We have uh, uh, telephone lines and, and we speak. And, and yes, they are fed up, but what can they do? What can they do? And they cannot do anything as, Part of the problem is that all the demonstrations that took place just uh, uh, not long time ago, two months ago, were in favor of the Hamas. But the suffering is because of the Hamas, not because of Israel. And yet, you, we, I saw so many uh, uh, people in the United States, in Europe, demonstrating against Israel and not against the Hamas. And I saw even Jews demonstrating with flags of uh, the Hamas. And I'm asking, are you crazy? Do you know that uh, one of the aims of the Hamas is extermination, not only of Israel, but also of Jews? No, they don't know. 
No, they don't know. And it's going on and on and on. And then they, uh, then, uh, uh, the uh, genocide uh, uh, lie. Uh, you know, it was Hitler who said that the Jew is the great danger uh, to humanity. Uh, some years ago, uh, it was Arun Gandhi who said, we have created a culture of violence. Israel and the Jews are the biggest players. Wow, Israel and the Jews. He does not even distinguish between uh, uh, Jews and Israel. And he was the head of an institution in uh, Rochester University. And that culture of violence is eventually going to destroy humanity. The same idea of the Nazis is expressed now by the most enlightened people. And it's going on and on and on and on and on. We don't have time to, uh, for all of it. Uh, for example, uh, Claire Short, uh, she was a minister in the British uh, government. The oppression of the Palestinian people is the major cause of violence in the world. Uh, millions are dead in Africa, in Asia, in other places since the, uh, established, since the foundation of Israel. And she's blaming Israel in the violence. I mean, it's an obsession. By the way, she also blamed Israel in the global warming. I have no idea what is the connection between Israel and the global warming, but she did, but she did. And it's going on and on and on. We don't have time. Uh, 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 I mean, it's not only scholars and activists. When you go to uh, public polls, you find out that people think that Israel has the most negative influence in the world, unfortunately. The propaganda is working, eventually. The propaganda is uh, working. Just to give you the numbers in order to know the facts and not the blood libels. Uh, since the foundation of Israel up to now, between 86 to 190 uh, uh, million people were killed in a lot of conflicts wars. Among them, uh, 12 million people were killed in the Arab world. Most of them, by the way, by Muslim and Arabs. In the Israeli-Arab conflict, between 80 to 120,000 people were killed, which I'm not proud about. We had wars, we had conflicts. We were threatened with extermination and we had to defend ourselves, which we did. Since 67 up to now, in the West Bank and Gaza, all together with all the operation, cast lead and, and so on, we are speaking about between 11 to 12,000 people that were killed. Again, which I'm sorry about, but most of them are what we call combatants, terrorists. And it's going on and on and on and on. And you see now the, the, just, the just published poll, which is a tragedy. You see that young uh, 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 American Jews, and you can see it here on the graph, uh, so many of them, 33 uh, percent of the Jews under 40 believe that Israel is committing a genocide against the Palestinians. Let me tell you something. Sometimes we do not understand how blood libels uh, were disseminated uh, in the old age. Here it is now. People believe to the blood libels against Israel, which is a tragedy. 33% believe that Israel is committing a genocide. We are committing a genocide. What are you talking about? The main threat right now uh, uh, to the public peace is the jihad terror. And you can see here the numbers, not of wars, only the global jihad. Global jihad is killing every uh, uh, month about 1,000 people. We do not hear about most of them. You know why? Because the global jihad is not killing Israelis, is not killing Americans, is not killing Europeans. The global jihad is killing mainly Muslims in Asia, in Africa. They kill themselves. But I did not see demonstration because of what happening in Yemen, in Somalia, in Nigeria, in other places. Who cares about it? As long as they kill each other, nobody really cares about. Altogether, we are speaking about more than a quarter of a million of people that were killed by the global jihad. Nobody cares about them. And it's going on and on and on. What is the ideology of the Hamas? Here we have the, the leader of the Muslim brothers. 
saying publicly, Allah imposed uh, Hitler upon the Jews uh, to punish them. Next time it will be at the hand of the believers, which means of the Muslims. And he is, by the way, uh, uh, he has uh, a weekly show in Al Jazeera, this person who is the leader of the Hamas and all the other Muslim Brothers uh, movement. And, uh, and uh, what is the Hamas uh, broadcasting? You can see it. This is from the uh, official uh, channel of uh, the Hamas. I can show you a lot of them. We don't have the time. I want to continue because I guess uh, my time uh, is uh, high limited. That's exactly, by the way, what they teach their children in the children uh, programs. Kill the Jews, kill the Jews, kill the Jews. And then you see Jews demonstrating with the flags of the Hamas. It's crazy. It's just crazy. And it has nothing to do with uh, uh, politics, being a right winger, being a left winger, nothing to do. We don't have time. I'm passing, I'm passing, I'm passing because I want, uh, you heard about uh, three years ago, the peaceful demonstrations. Here uh, is what you do not see, not in your new newspapers and not on your uh, TV screens. Unfortunately, the CNN and the New York Times did not show it. That's what they are doing. Yes, they sympathize with the uh, uh, Nazi flag. And it's going on and on and on, something which has been expressed by a, a British journalist, forming your opinion about Israel and the, uh, on the basis of Western media reports is a bit like deciding what you think uh, of the Second World War based on reports uh, on the firebombing of Germany. Just think about it. And it's going on and on, uh, peace. Why do, do we have, uh, uh, don't we have peace? Uh, I'm trying to do it uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, the, the first time that uh, a Palestinian state was offered was in 2000. Uh, and it was offered by Ehud Barak, who was the prime minister. And, and some months later, it was offered by Bill Clinton, who was the president of the United States. And there was, in that time, I have to admit that there was a turning point. It was, there was a turning, turning point because for the first time, Arab leaders accepted the idea of two states for two peoples, which mean a Jewish state and a Palestinian state for the first time. And the men who convinced the Arab leaders to accept the Clinton uh, plan was uh, uh, bin Dar ben Sultan. He was ambassador uh, of Saudi Arabia in uh, Washington, a very close friend of uh, Bill Clinton. And uh, Everyone was uh, waiting to Arafat after Israel responded and say, okay, we are uh, taking it. We are uh, accepting uh, the plan. And Bandar Ben Sultan met Yasser Arafat in Rich Hotel in Washington. And he told him this sentence, if we lose this opportunity for peace, we had enough. We don't want uh, the conflict anymore. If we, lose, if we lose this opportunity, it's, it is not going to be a tragedy. This is going to be a crime. Arafat from Rich Hotel went to the White House and he committed both a tragedy and a crime. How do I know what happened behind closed doors? I know it because Bindar Ben Sultan himself published it, not one time, but again and again. And it happened uh, 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 again in 2008 when Ehud Olmert, who was a prime minister, uh, uh, put his own peace plan uh, on the table, which was very close to the uh, Clinton plan. Now it was not Yasser Arafat, it was Abu Mazen. And here is what uh, Condoleezza Rice is telling in her book. She put the plan on the table and asked Abu Mazen, okay, we can have peace, let's go for it. And his uh, reaction was, I cannot tell 4 million Palestinians that only 5,000 of them can go home. 
Look, it's very interesting because the main obstacle uh, is not settlements. And you can have any opinions that you want about uh, uh, settlement. Whoever will read uh, uh, my articles in English know about my opinions, uh, but it's not important right now. The main problem was not settlement. The main problem was this demand of the Palestinians for the right of return, which means for the destruction of Israel. This is the meaning. It's not me who is saying it. It's what they say. Now, it's very interesting. If you, uh, Arafat, Abu Mazen, want a Palestinian state, how comes that you want all your people to go to another state? That is the meaning of what they say, actually. And uh, it went on. The same story, again, in 2014, when John Kerry and Obama offered the Palestinians, again, two states for two people solution. And again, it was rejected, not even by Netanyahu, who was not so much enthusiastic about the idea, but he accepted. And uh, they rejected uh, his uh, plan. We are only seven years after the last uh, uh, peace plan that was rejected by the Palestinians. And then Ben and Jerry boycott Israel. Why don't you boycott uh, those who refused, those who rejected to any peace plan? Why Israel? You should ask them. And uh, uh, as I told you, they say by themselves, if refugees return to Israel, Israel will not, uh, 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 will cease to exist, and so on and so on and so on. The right of return is the winning card for the end of Israel. That's what they declare. And Sai Barakat, personally, we uh, were quite friends. At Camp David, they offered us 90%, and Olmert offered us 100%. Why, why should we hurry? So I'm asking again. I'm against any kind of boycott, but why do you boycott Israel? When he is admitting, not he, not only him, all the Palestinians are admitting again and again, we rejected all the peace plans. And then you put the blame on Israel. And it's going on and on. I don't have time to show you uh, all of this because uh, we don't uh, uh, really uh, have time. Uh, one of the leaders, we will never accept the two states uh, uh, for two people's uh, solution. Uh, two words about the BDS. BDS is not about peace. BDS is not about two states solution. BDS is about the destruction of Israel. Here are the two leaders of the BDS. Let's hear them. Ben Dror, the uh, sound is muted on this video. Just make sure that the um, screen sharing has audio sharing enabled. and uh, it's going on and on. Actually, you will not find one BDS leader activist who accept the two states for two people solution. But they claim we are a nonviolent uh, movement. No, you are a movement that is supporting the destruction of one state on earth. And it's going on and on and on, they claim about uh, the Israeli apartheid. Let me tell you something about the Israeli apartheid that maybe uh, many of you don't know. Uh, here is Moshe Katsav, who was the president of Israel. He was sentenced uh, to seven years in jail, which I'm not proud about. What does it have to do uh, with BDS and apartheid, the apartheid uh, blood libel? He had three judges who sent him to uh, seven years in jail. The presiding judge was George Kara an Israeli Arab. You can say a lot of things about Israel. Israel is not an apartheid state. Uh, or Dr. Khadjir, uh, uh, chairman of Bank Lumi, actually is a national bank of Israel. Yes, an Arab Muslim in Israel is. Uh, and uh, uh, last chapter, last chapter, because we don't have time, uh, which is highly important chapter. Uh, many times, as we saw just two months ago, uh, are accepting the right of Israel to defend itself. But they are saying, okay, but you do it in a very disproportional way. You kill too many uh, Arabs. And uh, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, and uh, others, and uh, um, sorry, and, and uh, John Oliver uh, that I guess you heard about, 
with his uh, speech against Israel, there is a massive imbalance while most of the rockets aimed toward Israeli citizens were intercepted. Israel airstrikes were not, they hit their targets. Such a stupid argument, such a stupid, I mean, we have to apologize that we can defend ourselves. Now, the, the, I mean, speaking about criticism uh, of, of this uh, uh, kind of that Israel is uh, retaliating in a disproportionate way, the, the most terrible report was the Goldstone report after the Castle operation. And the same spirit uh, was also uh, two months ago. And the Goldstone report, I corresponded with him in that time before he published uh, his report. The Goldstone report, uh, the main claim of 600 pages that you did not read, but I uh, had to read. The Goldstone report was that Israel in intentionally, intentionally killed innocent civilians. Wow, I know my friends, I know uh, the Israeli army, nobody intentionally uh, killed innocent civilians. In that time, he was interviewed again and again in order to explain uh, his uh, report. And he was asked the same question again and again. And the question was, look, innocent civilians are killed in every battlefield. Why do you blame Israel in intentionally killing innocent civilians? Let's hear what he said. Ben George, just make sure that you have the uh, sound sharing enabled. Uh, the sound is currently not traveling through the computer. Fair enough, he did not check the uh, US Army. But three days later, he was asked the same question by Bill Moyers, maybe uh, he is much more familiar uh, to you. Uh, the same kind of question, and now he has a new response. which means that in three days he conducted a new investigation and now he knows, before he did not know, now he knows that the US Army uh, uh, is uh, taking uh, all the measures in order to protect innocent civilians. Now, let me tell you something. When uh, Martin Dempsey, the chief of the uh, US Army was asked, I will not show you the video because we don't have time. Then he said, then he said, when I want to know how to defend innocent civilians, I have to send my officers to Israel because Israel is doing it much better than any uh, other army. Uh, let's go on. The New York Times, I guess most of you know what I'm talking about just two months ago when he published this first page, first front uh, uh, page with the uh, Palestinian children uh, that were killed. I asked the spokesman of uh, the New York Times, uh, just one question. Did you ever publish pictures, images of children that were killed by the US Army in Iraq or in Afghanistan? As you received a, as an answer, I received an answer. Anyway, anyway, it's very interesting because just two weeks before this publication, uh, it was published in many, uh, in many newspapers uh, that 1600 children were killed by the US drones. A picture of someone in the front page of uh, the New York Times or of any other newspaper? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was not any. And it's going on and on. Now, remember what uh, Goldstone said. Here are the numbers of how many combatants and non-combatants were killed in the battlefield. Just uh, uh, to make it uh, uh, the whole story short, uh, not only absolutely, but also proportionally, Israel killed much less, much less than the coalition uh, uh, armies 
in uh, Iraq and uh, in Afghanistan. And, and just one example of an Italian uh, journalist uh, who published after he went out of the Gaza Strip. We got a sense of how careful Israel was to avoid civilian casualties during the airstrikes in Gaza. The Israeli army called one guy we met and spent 45 minutes on the phone with him, getting him to evacuate his neighbors before they blew up a Hamas building. Yes, this is Israel. And here are some experts saying, saying just the opposite to what Godson said. Uh, the IDF takes many more precautions that are requiring, that, that, uh, than are required setting an unreasonable uh, president. Again, just the opposite by people who know uh, what they're talking about. Uh, I will skip it because we have to get to the end. Now, here uh, I'm coming to the end. This is the age distribution in Gaza Strip. If Goldstone was right, and if other people who are speaking about indiscriminate fire were right, the uh, age distribution of the people who were killed by Israel should have been almost the same, even not really the same. I took the list that was published by the Hamas, age and gender, every day they published. And I created the same kind of graph. And here is the result. You can see in green, the most of the people who were killed are men in the fighting age, much less women, much less elderly people, much less uh, younger people. I mean, without checking every name, you can understand that those claims against Israel are a kind of a blood libel. I mean, Israel is taking all the measures. I mean, Israel is uh, killing innocent civilians, but much less than in any other battlefield in the world. I'm speaking only about Western armies. I'm not speaking about uh, other armies. Eventually, uh, let me tell you, uh, I also made the comparison of all the other battlefields, and I'm going just to the, and, and you can find out that uh, Israel is killing much less, but this is not the point. The point is that uh, after my research, I sent one more uh, email to Goldstone, and here I finish. And I told him, look, uh, you were right about the American army that, that uh, did whatever is possible in order to protect innocent civilians, but look at the numbers that I sent him. Look at the numbers. The meaning is that Israel took much, much, much more precautions in order to defend innocent civilians. So the US army cannot even be compared to the Israeli army in that sense. It was the first time that he did not answer, that he did not, uh, answer me. But he published an article in the Washington Post. The New York Times, uh, as I understood, uh, did not want to publish it. And according to his new version, uh, he retracted. And he uh, uh, wrote, if I had known when, uh, uh, if I had known then what I know now, the Goldstone report would have been a different report. This is uh, my last uh, uh, slide, and I want to tell you that's exactly uh, what I wanted to tell you. I want people to know it has nothing to do with political views. First of all, of all, let's go to facts. People should know the facts. And when they don't know the facts, the outcome is that so many people, Jews and non-Jews, think that Israel is committing crimes against humanity. Thank you so much for listening. I rest my case. Thank you so much. That was a very informative and uh, in many ways disturbing presentation. We have a lot of questions. Um, I think on the minds of many people is, and we're getting a lot of this, the, the similar question here that why do you think so many, so many intellectuals and writers and journalists are spreading uh, these fabrications? Is it that they don't uh, know the data you've presented? 
Uh, some of them do, some of them don't. I mean, when we are speaking about the uh, young students, uh, which I meet many times when, I mean, not in the corona time, but uh, when I give uh, uh, lectures uh, in uh, universities, they don't know. But I guess their uh, uh, professors, they are supposed to know. And I'm asking myself again and again, the same kind of question, why they are lying? Why they are lying? And I think it's a kind of, I mean, it's, it's, there are many reasons. One of the reasons is the uh, uh, post-colonial uh, school of thought. You cannot blame any country, you can blame only, uh, only Israel. There are, uh, uh, and we are in an atmosphere that, that uh, the world is, uh, is, uh, uh, has only two uh, uh, ends, one uh, of oppressors and one of people who are oppressed. And, and Israel is perceived uh, wrongly, but, but that's how Israel is perceived, like the oppressor. And, and many times when people know the fact, they just, I mean, they are a, a part of the, uh, how to say it in English, the herd uh, phenomena. I mean, they are part of, of uh, something which is bigger than them. This is the fashion, this is the trend. This is what we have to say in order to be liberals, progressives, and so on. I have nothing against uh, liberals. I'm liberal uh, myself. But liberalism doesn't mean lies. Unfortunately, this is the reality uh, right now. Sometimes um, I've, I've noticed in your writings, you talk about, you talk about the Jewish Nakba. Uh, what is that? What do you mean by the Jewish Nakba and why is that uh, important for this um, discussion? Uh, it is highly important because I, I'll give you a, just an example from my family. I spoke about the people who were forced out uh, in uh, uh, 48 and 49 and uh, the beginning of the 50s. But I can speak even about my grandfather, mother, who escaped Yemen, uh, and she escaped Yemen in a uh, hundred years ago, at the end of the First World War. And she escaped because there was the, um, uh, how it's called, uh, the uh, infant de decree, which means if you don't have parents, uh, you are forcibly uh, forced to be a Muslim. She did not want to be a Muslim, so she escaped with a group of uh, other uh, uh, young people and, and a group of people that escaped from uh, Yemen to Port Said in Egypt. And from Port Said, she managed her way uh, to Israel when she was uh, only a kid. Now, they escaped. I mean, she never, by the way, she never thought that she's a refugee. She didn't have any, she didn't understand about population exchange, about imperialism, about colonialism, about nation state. She wanted uh, only one thing, to find a shelter. And so many other people in that time. In 48, yes, it was because of the uh, establishment of a Jewish state, because of the partition resolution. And then many Jews, in Arab countries. I'm not speaking about refugees from Europe. We all know about them after the Holocaust. I'm speaking about uh, so many Jews, almost a million, that were not all of them were forced out. Many of them escaped because of the change in the atmosphere, because of the pogrom. Most of them, by the way, uh, all their property was confiscated. All their property. So when people speak about the a Palestinian Nakba, yes, it happened. I'm not someone who is denying the fact that yes, people were, but millions were ex uh, escaped in that time. I showed you 60 million were escaped. Among them also a bigger number of Jews from Arab countries. And they did not fight against uh, Egypt or Libya or Morocco or Yemen or Syria or Iraq and yet they paid the price, and yet their property was confiscated. This is a Jewish Nakba that is totally ignored, totally ignored by so many scholars. We have a question here that says, um, it seems that many of your arguments are based on comparative analysis, meaning when some critic claims Israel is bad, uh, your response is to ask bad compared to what? Uh, compared to which nation? Um, why is comparative analysis so important for assessing the morality of Israel? 
No, my main claim is that Israel is not committing uh, war crimes. I don't think, by the way, I showed you the numbers, and the, the, I mean, of course, it is all detailed in my book, but uh, with all the footnotes and the sources. And, and But my claim is not that Israel is committing uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity. Uh, it's not my claim. My claim is that Israel is not committing. How do I know that Israel is not committing? Because when I, uh, one, one of the ways in order to uh, show it is that actually Israel is doing any, any effort in order, in order not to harm innocent civilians. And what I show you is the result. And the result is that actually Israel is receiving the highest uh, uh, number of headlines of each uh, uh, kid that is killed. But actually, the minimal number of, of casualties by the Israeli bombardments or so on. And we have to bear one more thing uh, uh, we have to bear in mind. When we are speaking about uh, radical Islam, it has nothing to do with Israel. Radical Islam is operating in Yemen, in Somalia, in Nigeria, North Nigeria, uh, in Libya, in Iraq, in, uh, in uh, uh, Lebanon. Wherever you have radical Islam, you have bloodshed and destruction. I mean, you cannot have radical Islam without a, a destruction. So it has nothing to do with Israel. Hamas is part of the radical Islam movement, Muslim brothers or others. So it has nothing to do with Israel, actually. If you want to demonstrate, you should against the radical Islam, not in favor of the radical Islam. I mean, it's so when I see those people, Jews, non-Jews, demonstrating against Israel instead of to demonstrate against the main cause of bloodshed, of crimes. I'm pissed off. I mean, what? I mean, what are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, you are demonstrating against Israel and claim that Israel is committing uh, uh, crimes when Israel is doing every effort in order not to harm innocent people. It's not me who is saying it. It's experts. It's the, the uh, chief of the US Army. They know a bit about battlefields. And they are saying, yes, Israel, uh, the standards of Israel uh, are unacceptable because we cannot even uh, uh, go accordingly. We cannot behave accordingly. So it's not that Israel is committing war crimes less than others. Israel is not committing. I cannot tell you that there are not here and there. Yes, there are much less than in any other uh, army. We had the case of El Or Azaria, maybe you heard about, I mean, that was sentenced, uh, was in jail. We have, of course we have, but it's something so marginal, I mean, so few, and we cannot ignore it. Yeah, your, your book does a fantastic job of, of laying out the, um, the, the health, Palestinian health data, which you touched on in your talk here, uh, which seems to obliterate any suggestion of genocide or, or, or any of that. So we have a question here about population increase. If you could talk about pop Palestinian population increases and how that um, contradicts claims of genocide yeah. and cleansing. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you can uh, compare the numbers from 67 up to now uh, of, of how many Palestinians you had in 67. Um, it's one of the highest uh, population uh, 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 growth um, in, in the world. I think there are, I don't remember exactly, I think uh, I, I have it in my book. I think uh, right now they are in the third or uh, fourth place in the world in population growth. I mean, how can you, how can you really uh, reconcile uh, genocide with the, one of the highest uh, population growth? You cannot, but because we are speaking about Israel, you can manipulate as much as you want. And that's what people do. Genocide, what are you talking about? I mean, sorry to say it, I'm, 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 it's, it's a bit of cliche, uh, uh, but more people were killed uh, in Chicago in car accidents than, uh, than uh, Palestinians uh, from the Israeli army. Genocide. Yeah, I think what you're bringing up is, uh, what, what do we do about it? How do you combat these lies and advocate for the truth when uh, it seems that facts are so readily dismissed? Um, like what What's the plan? I'll tell you, I'll tell you, so I'm going to disappoint you all now. I'm really going to disappoint you because I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, a Hasbara person, you know. I'm not. You know the word Hasbara, I guess, already in, uh, in English. 
uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm a researcher. I'm a journalist. Many times, by the way, in, uh, in Hebrew and in English, I criticize uh, my own uh, government. It's not that I accept everything that uh, the Israeli government is doing. Uh, I'm not dealing with Asbara. As a researcher, I put the facts on the table. You should use it. You, people, everyone. I do. I do. I'm trying to deliver my goods to every audience, to mainly uh, but not only, of course, to uh, 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 young students. I want them to know the facts because otherwise, otherwise they are brainwashed. And I saw the process, what happened. In, Ber in Berkeley, for example, they had a kind of, uh, in Hillel club, I guess you know the Hillel clubs in the universities. And, and they had a kind of uh, cooperation with uh, uh, some Palestinian groups. The point is that the, Jewish side is coming to uh, those uh, uh, goodwill uh, meetings without any knowledge. And the Palestinians are coming with two, four, two world, uh, one world. They want justice. They want, uh, they want right of return. And, 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 and the uh, Jewish side from Hillel, they have no idea what they're talking about. Ah, justice, yes, it's good. You know, it's not only justice, it's tikkun olam and human rights. And, and they are attracted to this kind of language. Yes, I am in favor of tikkun olam. I am in favor of justice. But first of all, I am in favor of facts and reality uh, and truth. And they are manipulated. Now, you know, it was a, a British philosopher who, say, who said that uh, knowledge is power. Actually, in this age, uh, ignorance is power. Hmm. You know, Canberra has a large campus program as well, and some of our college students are actually listening and, and watching you. Uh, what advice would you give these college students who are about to face the hostility you describe uh, this fall? Um, first of all, to learn the facts, know what to say. I mean, because, I mean, first, know the facts. Second, yes, you have to say, you have to speak up. Don't be shy, speak up. The main problem is the radical Islam. And the radical Islam is not the enemy of Israel. It's a big mistake. Radical Islam is a big enemy of, of Muslims. You have to say, I mean, Israel is not suffering from it. Yes, okay, we have once uh, in five, six years, uh, a kind of uh, confrontation with the Hamas. But who is paying the price? The people in Gaza, the people of Nigeria, the people of Somalia, the people of Yemen. The people of Iraq, of Syria, of Pakistan, of Afghanistan, they are paying the price, not Israel. Israel is doing quite well, but they are paying the price. Why don't you care about them? Why don't you care about the real reason to the destruction and to the bloodshed? It's not Israel. Israel is only defending itself. We don't want to be in Gaza. We want, all of us want Gaza to prosper. So you have to know the facts. That's all what, because because I'm not dealing with Asbara. All what I can say is learn the basic facts about the conflict. Israel is not colonialism. Israel is an anti-imperialist movement, anti-colonialist movement, like a, a many other movements of the time, and so on and so on. You have to know the facts. If somebody is talking with you about the Nakba, you have to tell him immediately. Nakba, what are you talking about? 60 million people were forced out. More Jews were forced out from Arab countries. Jewish Nakba. This is the real Nakba. Not people who attacked Israel and paid the price, but people who did not attack anybody and yet paid, paid the price. This is the real Nakba. You have to know the facts. And if you know the facts, it will be, you will be confident in order to deliver the message. Don't apologize, just say the facts. Excellent. We actually have a number of people here who do want to hear you speak for seven hours. So I think we'll have to invite you back. They want to see your slides. But one last question, uh, perhaps a prediction. If these, if these fabrication, if these lies go unanswered and they continue as they're going, uh, where do you think it's going to lead? If the um, industry of lies continues, where will this go? Uh, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you, first of all, it's something which has to do with... Um, uh, the school of thought uh, which is taking place in the United States and, and 
somehow also in Europe. I mean, it's, it's an American problem because those who are anti-Israelis many times are also anti-Americans. Let's not forget it. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading, you know, the leading uh, newspapers and uh, academic articles from uh, the United States. And I see that they have a problem with themselves, with the West, with being Americans. I mean, I mean, everything is uh, uh, oppressed and uh, uh, oppressor. I mean, this kind of terminology is, is a, a, a kind of self-destructive one. So it has nothing to do with Israel. I mean, Israel is a kind of victim. Yes, of course. I mean, what does have the BLM to do with the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict? Okay, they have an invention that uh, uh, actually uh, the officers uh, were trained uh, in Israel, which is a lie, nothing to do with what happened, not in Ferguson and not with George Floyd. And, but, but it's easy to sell the lies because you need uh, uh, somebody. So uh, the Americans are suffering because they are also anti-Americans many times. Those, I'm not speaking about liberals, I'm speaking about those radical progressives, uh, as you call them now, uh, walk, I think. So you have a problem. It has nothing to do with Israel. I mean, I mean, I wish, I, I wish the American problem could have been solved. I wish. And then also the, uh, uh, but yes, we have a problem because we see what is happening in the, uh, in the, in some parts, in some the pro progressive parts of the uh, Democratic uh, uh, Party. We see it. I mean, we see it. I have nothing to do. I don't want to be uh, uh, political. I'm not saying now a war began against the, the uh, 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 one party or another. I'm not, I'm not, but I'm saying we see, we see that those who um, uh, were brainwashed in universities, they are coming and going up and becoming, uh, I don't know what, uh, Congress people and, and so on. Well, thank you so much again, Mr. Yamini. It was, uh, I hope to have you back. Uh, it was a very thought provoking talk. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. And again, I want to recommend to everyone your book, Industry of Lies. It's a, it's a must read. Um, I, I, I just one uh, remark. Uh, sure. I, have, uh, I have some, no, I have some uh, invitations already to lectures. Uh, so I can tell you that uh, at, uh, in, I think it's October that I'm coming to the United States. And again, to San Francisco and to the West Coast in December. So if somebody here uh, wants any kind of lecture, you will know how to contact me uh, because at least two times, if the corona will not, uh, will not spread uh, too much, uh, I, I'm, I'm planning to come uh, uh, at least two times next uh, year. Oh, that's great to hear because the audience numbers are still great. Uh, people are still online right now watching. So thank you very much again. And unfortunately our, our time is up. Uh, but if, um, again, I, I just wanna recommend your book. And I also wanna add that if you wanna combat this industry of lies, if you're itching to get involved in the fight for truth, uh, then I'd like to encourage you to join CAMERA's media response team. It's our volunteer team of letter writers who protest inaccuracies in the media. Uh, many letters to the editor, which you see in major newspapers around the world. Um, are actually from people who are part of our camera's 18,000 strong letter writing team. Uh, we'd like you to be part of it. We wanna grow it. Uh, if you're already a member, please invite one or two of your trusted friends to join. Uh, they can quickly sign up by emailing Sarah Miller at smiller at camera.org. That's S-M-I-L-L-E-R at camera.org. Uh, Sarah will quickly get them signed up to receive our alerts and our action items which again is a powerful way for you to help combat this uh, industry of lies. Uh, the bigger we are, the more impact we have. So please join us or get others to join. But in any case, thank you again for, for being with us today. I wish you a good day. And that concludes today's program.